Hi everyone, uh, welcome back to another exciting and very physics-oriented corner of Astronomy 322. Today we are going to be exploring the wonderful content called The Structure of Stellar Systems. So, so far we've really focused on where uh, stars are in the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, which is fundamentally a statement of essentially like what the properties of a bunch of stars are. So if I form a bunch of stars using isochrones, fitting, uh, using dust analysis, binarity, all that stuff, we can really understand the overall light emerging from a bunch of stars. But when we look at galaxies, what we see is basically we see a shape and we are mostly focused on the color of that galaxy. But now we're gonna turn to the shape of that galaxy. So this raises a lot of questions, like why do galaxies have the individual shapes that they do? Um, and this is uh, because galaxies are not fixed solid objects. They consist of a bunch of stuff inside them. Uh, the stars and the gas are all moving around within uh, the galaxy. And so what we'd like to do is uh, understand a bit about how the gas moves around and why it maintains the shape that it does over time. Or does it? really. I uh, haven't proven that to you. Uh, and then the other question that we run is try to understand the colors that we see and see if we can sort of understand the history of the system in terms of the dynamics. Is there something in the way the stars move that give us uh, different shapes. So a lot of the answers we have about shapes is it comes from the study of stellar dynamics. So today what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about the shapes of galaxies that we see and get a little more quantitative about that. And then from there, we're gonna turn it over and um, actually start to explore the physics of why those shapes happen. So the first thing I want to focus on is on disk galaxies. Uh, these are uh, something we've covered before, and we've made the point that galaxies often have this kind of disky structure here. Uh, so we have an inclined disk that we're sort of point, uh, seeing edge on here. And this figure looks a lot like the coordinate system that I sketched over here on uh, that side, which we've explored a bit before, where we assume that the star, the galaxy is essentially symmetric if we rotate it around. It's not, there's these spiral arms and everything, but we're going to assume, like the Sombrero galaxy over here, that it's a symmetric system. Um, and uh, that gives us a good cylindrical polar coordinate system, and then we use the distance out of the plane as the place where it really changes. And you can see over here in this figure that galaxies are actually pretty thin. Um, uh, if you've ever seen like DVDs, uh, the dimensions of our galaxy is about the thickness, the aspect ratio is about the thickness of two CDs or DVDs kind of stuck together uh, there. So it's, they're very thin given their extent. Uh, also, just uh, to justify the um, uh, use of the uh, axis metric, I'll note that arms and stellar bars, these figures that really leap out in the light, really are only about 20% perturbations. So there's only a variation of about 20% uh, of the distribution in terms of the stars uh, in the galaxy or the mass in the galaxy. They just show up in the light for reasons that we'll talk about next week. So given it's a cylindrical polar coordinate system, something that we like to do is to fit it to uh, a function. So we're going to describe the density of material. And here I'm going to use the variable rho to describe the density. That's going to usually be specified as the mass per unit volume. So we'll use that as the rho. And that has a three-dimensional form that has the cylindrical polar symmetry. So we have some constant value, which is the density at the center of the galaxy. And then it's going to have a term here that falls off like an exponential, and that's essentially the radial extent. So these galaxies are falling off radially. And then there's gonna be some function that describes the vertical extent of this, this, uh, this system. So this gives us a good expression for uh, what the galaxies actually look like. Notice because it's uh, spare, uh, circularly symmetric or uh, cylindrical, rotationally symmetric, uh, there is no pha, uh, theta term in this. It's just R and Z as the only values that are in here. 
And I've been very cagey about what F is because the literature and science, uh, like the astrophysicists, like to use a bunch of different functions. Uh, we're actually going to use some of these different functions, so I kind of want to have them all in my kit uh, as to what they look like. And here I'm going to define this variable zeta as a dimensionless, uh, a dimensionless height, and that's going to be the actual distance above the plane divided by what I'm going to call the scale height. So h is something that we'll call about, and this is called the scale scale height. And you'll notice if I go back to the um, radial term, there's actually a scale length to the disk as well, rd. So we see this pattern a lot in astrophysics where everything is kind of non-dimensionalized to kind of a characteristic scale of the system, so the functions stay kind of nice and neat. Over here in uh, the scale height for galaxies, the, the zeta is normalized by however thick the galaxy disk is. And so what we talk about when we say, okay, this is how thick the disk is, we usually talk about the scale height of the disk because they actually go off formally to infinity even though they fall away pretty quickly. It's kind of like the atmosphere on the Earth. There's a scale height to it, but there's no concrete barrier at the top that indicates the top of the atmosphere. Okay, so the functional forms that we have are uh, and are just given by these names. Uh, we'll often see something that's like a Gaussian or an exponential, which is just e to the minus zeta squared over 2 or e to the minus the absolute value of zeta. Uh, we'll often deal with physical motivated forms, uh, which we'll call sech or sech squared. Uh, sech uh, is a the hyperbolic secant. So you may have seen cosh and sinh, which are the hyperbolic sine and cosine. Uh, the form of the hyperbolic secant is 1 over the hyperbolic cosine. So it's a hyperbolic secant. Okay. And then this is the actual functional form for it. So it's, so it's 2 over e to the minus zeta over e to the plus zeta. And so the nature of this is as you're getting off of the disk, if you're going off in the positive direction, uh, this term ends up dominating over here. Uh, the e to the zeta term, and it gets really large, and this will limit to 2e to the minus zeta. Uh, and if the go off in the negative direction, it sort of limits off to negative 2e to the minus zeta, or yeah, two, sorry, it limits to 2e to the minus zeta again. Um, so that becomes the dominant term. The other term in there drops away to zero. And so what that does is it's kind of a compromise. Um, between an exponential form and something that's kind of physical here. And so I illustrate that over here with this sech squared profile, which is a hyperbolic secant squared uh, profile. And it just shows you that, um, well, we might have an exponential function, which works out really well in a lot of cases. And uh, the problem with an exponential function, if I zoom in here, is it's kind of peaky towards the center. It's like, we don't like things that are not smooth. There's no clear defined derivative there. So this exponential function is pretty simple and actually describes the system reasonably well. Uh, the problem with it is that it just seems to um, not capture what the behavior at the center of the galaxy very well. And so this uh, secant uh, sech or sech squared profiles, what they do is they get a little softer in the middle. And so you can sort of see that here, that in the limit, this hyperbolic uh, secant uh, squared function has an exponential behavior when you're far off of the galaxy. This is so this is the midpoint of the galaxy. That's below the galaxy and that's above the galaxy. Uh, so they all limit to the same functional form, but they have a sort of softer, smooth distribution in the center of the galaxy. Now, we focus a lot on the sech squared uh, profile, uh, and there's a reason for that. There's a bunch of physics that essentially makes some assumptions, and this particular profile falls out of that. I've buried that in the appendix of your book in case you're kind of a keen person who likes to understand these things. Uh, but um, the uh, literature seems to be kind of favoring this sech profile, and it's just an empirical fit. We look at the data, and it seems to kind of follow it. So. Um, the nice thing about this set squared layer, uh, sometimes called a Spitzer layer, so if I say that accidentally, this is what I'm talking about, 
uh, is that from physics alone, you can determine what this uh, uh, scale height is. And the variables that go into that uh, are the velocity dispersion in the z direction. So this is the velocity dispersion of the stars. And then this stuff down here is the mass density at the midplane. So this is, again, mass density. And this complicated thing in the size is just that z gal equals zero. So this just means at midplane, where above the plane is plus z and below the plane is minus z. And so what's kind of neat about this is that these are how the stars are moving up and down. Um, uh, from the uh, plane that's captured over here uh, with the velocity dispersion in the up and down direction. And uh, so if that's larger, the galaxy just kind of pops up, H gets larger. And if the density, that means that's the gravity that's holding this together. Notice there's a G running around in here, so it has to do with gravitation. Gravitational force is higher, and so that thins the disk out. So that makes this a little thinner. So there isn't a nice explanation for like why the set profile has the scale height that it does, but it does seem to be related to the physics. And these are the same basic trends that you see in uh, the galaxies that we observe. Higher velocity dispersions are puffier disks. Higher mass densities are thinner disks. Now, the problem that we often run into is we are not necessarily looking uh, all the way through and resolving the thickness of galaxies. That sombrero case is really nice, and we can sort of see these galaxies edge on sometimes, and we can resolve them. But often we're looking at a galaxy face on, and so that means that we don't actually see through the disk, but we see a narrow projection through, uh, we, we see kind of a line of sight that's passing through the disk. So if this is my material in the disk, my line of sight will often end up just passing through the disk in this direction. So what we do is we actually just sort of say, well, what happens if we see that galaxy all flattened down and all the mass is kind of projected at one place along the line of sight? Uh, in that case, what you're going to do is you don't see a volume density of mass, but you see what we call a surface density of mass, which is the integrated mass along the line of sight. Uh, so we essentially say, okay, we're going to define the actual surface density as what happens if we don't see uh, that line of sight, but we're going to look straight through the disk. We're going to integrate up the amount of mass that's found along this path. And so we integrate over just one direction, that's the uh, z direction, and we integrate the thickness and we carry out this integral and we get what's we label as sigma, which is the surface density of the material. And so that turns out uh, we can pull out, it's separable, so we can pull out the scale height of the, or the scale length of the disk and the central density, and then we just end up integrating over these functions. And so we get a nice relationship between the scale height and the mass density at the center of the disk, depending on um, where, uh, what profile we assume, there's just a different set of numbers. Now, I will note that uh, we often end up in the scenario where we're not looking face on through the disk, but instead we're looking at an inclined value. Uh, so we often are looking off in this direction, but we actually refer to the surface density. So this is the surface density line of sight is uh, that one, uh, but we actually observe uh, that one. And so what we uh, define, uh, we define an angle, I, as the uh, inclination uh, between these uh, two lines of sight. And you can see that the relationship is that the observed surface density times the cosine of the inclination is what gives us the uh, true surface density. So we'll often have to apply this cos I uh, factor here. Uh, note that this is under the assumption that the height of the disk, height is much, much less than the scale length of the disk. Otherwise, this part of the line of sight is looking through very different densities than the, uh, play, the sort of symmetric part on the other side of the disk. Uh, so we end up seeing sort of through uh, at different sides. So this is under this assumption, but boy, we will apply this a lot.
Okay, so how does this actually stack up against reality? We can measure this. In fact, you can measure this on your homework, um, but we can ask, well, how does the density of the galaxy look uh, as we move off of the plane? Uh, this is measured for where we are right here in the solar circle. And uh, uh, so what we have are a graph this is the density at r0 so r0 is the 8.1 uh, kiloparsecs that we are from the center of the galaxy this is often called at the solar circle because if the sun was on a circular orbit this would be the radius of that circle and we measure how the stars fall off as we move in and out of the midplane. So this is below the plane of the galaxy. This is above the plane of the galaxy, off in those two directions. And so uh, what we see is uh, this is a logarithmic scale, 10 to the 0, 10 to the minus 1, 10 to the minus 2. Uh, so this is measured in solar masses per cubic parsec uh, here. And uh, these are the measures. And you can see that as we move away from the midplane, it falls off. And it falls off dramatically. The density of the stars uh, near uh, z equals zero uh, is uh, orders of magnitude larger than they are at like four kiloparsecs above uh, the galaxy. So the, these lines are straight in this graph. And so that's telling us that this looks a lot like an exponential profile. You might remember I made a very similar plot here, and these lines are straight in this semi-logarithmic axis. Uh, so what we get is these straight profiles here correspond to exponential behaviors. But you see that one line does not describe it pretty well overall. There's a part where a line here seems to capture the material in this part of the disk. And then you see that maybe these steeper lines here represent what's happening in the middle. And so because of this, we've sort of proposed historically the idea that there are different disks to the galaxy. Uh, there's what we call the thin disk because it has a small scale height, but consists of a lot of material in the stars. And then we have a thick disk, which is a sort of puffier disk that consists, uh, that sort of dominates in this middle range, a kiloparsec or a half off the plane of the galaxy. And then finally, this last little graph here at the bottom is the stars way out here at the end. And that is the, um, uh, that is the halo profile. It has a slightly different shape. So we give, it has this little weird bump in the middle, uh, but that's the, that's a different geometry. It's a non-disc geometry here. So this is what it actually looks like. And uh, we can kind of decompose this into the different scale heights and densities uh, here in the midplane. And so what this does is it's sure showing us the relative contributions to our galactic disk right here at the solar circle uh, in the different components. And so this is measuring the mass density of different parts. And you can see that we have the thin and the thick disk and then the halo. And so the thin disk dominates over the thick disk and the halo. There's way more material in the thin uh, disk than, uh, than the thick or the halo. So those are the stars are really important. But what's kind of cool, and we haven't talked about it very much, is the fact that the, where we are, the gas is also really important in the midplane. Overall, the mass of gas is small, but it, it has a very thin scale height, so its local volume density is relatively high. And then from this and some dynamics measurements, we can actually determine how much dark matter is in our environment. So that gives us this uh, limit here, uh, basically using dynamics to measure the total and then ruling out these parts. Now, the idea of breaking stuff down into disks is kind of an old school thing. And it's interesting because the thick disks have different properties than the thin disk stars. The thin disk tends to be younger, tends to be more metal rich. Thick disk uh, tends to be older and more metal poor. But if you come over here, you might believe that this is, I don't know, a little bit of a fiction. This is really 
a pretty continuous distribution here. And so the uh, modern thinking is that there aren't really distinctions between these disks uh, in like reality. There isn't two distinct populations that kind of formed at separate times or have different histories. So uh, yeah, we've kind of moved away from this, but it's still sometimes a useful descriptor to say, oh, this looks like a thick disk star and have that it's high above the midplane. It has a lower metallicity than other stars in the system. So it's often a good shorthand. Okay, uh, turning back to that surface density uh, plot, uh, one neat thing about this is we can use that to really pick out that exponential behavior. Uh, just flipping back here. In the surface density, we do expect an overall exponential trend and then uh, some constant out front that's just an integral over that function. It's a constant of order unity. Uh, and we look at this in other galaxies. So this is the galaxy, uh, one of my favorites, uh, this is NGC 4321 uh here and we can look at this and we see the mass density profile for the uh, stars in the galaxy falls off and it follows a fairly nice uh exponential trend there's a couple bumps those are spiral arm uh, structures inside the galaxy so tiny little variations and then in the center it ramps up and this represents the bulge of the galaxy so it's this extra stellar uh, contribution here at the center uh, this is the interstellar medium, the gas. It also sort of follows an exponential profile, but it's not super uh, well-defined. Seems to have a bit of a drop-off here, uh, but it's roughly also an exponential, so the gas seems to be following the same behavior as the stars do, though the stars are easier to form. Again, it shows evidence of a spike up where there's a bulge. Okay. Uh, the final thing that we should sort of talk about are density profiles of non-disk systems. We love disks, we live in one, so it's a very useful description of our local environment. Uh, but we also have elliptical galaxies and we have bulges in galaxies. And they tend to follow some a form in their surface density that's called a surcage profile. And this is the functional form of the surcage profile. It says this is my surface density at the middle, this is my surface density at a given point, and it's a function of radius. So these are, again, we sort of assume there is a well-defined radial coordinate, and then it has a bunch of parameters in it. The key one is n. So n here is, this is a shape parameter. And it typically runs on the value from n as 1 to 4. And so that sort of changes the shape of the structure. And then it has some constants in it. The RE here is the scale length, again, for the system. And then this BN is just a number. Uh, and that number is actually solved and is determined by the 1 over n. So this is basically bn is uh, a function of n. So everything in this is basically a two-parameter fit. It's the n and then the re. So re controls how big it is, and then n controls the shape. And we can see that by looking at the surface density profiles normalized to the central value as uh, for different curves of different ends. And this isn't super exciting uh, initially, but you'll notice that an n equals 1 profile is actually an exponential. So it's a straight line in a log linear plot, so then it's exponentials, and so this is uh, just representing an exponential disk. And then that extreme case of n equals 4, which is very typical of elliptical galaxies and a little less so of bulges, big rise up in the center uh, from that spike. So it has a very sharp cusp in the middle, and then it's a little fluffier out here in the edge. Uh, I've normalized all of these at r equals uh, r e, uh, so they'd all sort of go through the point, and you see these different shapes. So that's the important thing uh, that you need to know, is that n equals 4 is good for ellipticals, and they tend to have a much uh, cent uh, stronger central concentration, and we can actually see that here. This could be fit here. Oops, this could be fit here with a surcage profile, and that would kind of uh, incorporate all of that. Okay.
So at this point, we've talked about, about the mathematical description in the literature of what we see. And now we have to sort of think about what these are and what is the physics of these individual uh, uh, components and how do they get the shapes that they do. We'll actually talk about how they get to the shapes that they do next week, but uh, this week we want to go over the physics that we use to describe a bunch of stars. And it's kind of interesting because this is what a galaxy looks like. It's you know, This is the Andromeda galaxy. It's a section of this. And it is filled with a bunches and bunches of stars. You might look at this and you say, well, yeah, I see a star. There's one right there and there's one right there. All the ones that you can actually see really well as bright individual sources, those are foreground stars in our own galaxy. Uh, but all the individual stars are stuff like these little ones here. Uh, which are in the distant galaxy. So the faint stuff is what we actually see in the other galaxy. This is a gorgeous image, shows up poorly in my PDF, uh, but because I compressed it. But yeah, you, we, we'll, we'll take a look on this in more detail uh, later. But anyways, we see lots and lots and lots of individual stars, and they're all moving with respect to each other. They're not anchored in jello or anything. Uh, they're actually flowing around and orbiting uh, the galaxy here. So they're all rotating off in, I think, that direction. Um, so uh, but streaming around the center of the galaxy down here, off in this direction. And we want to think about the physics of this system. So we know a lot about the uh, physics of the system uh, just by assuming that these things are uh, individual star particles and they're interacting under Newtonian gravity. Let's think about the consequences of that. So a typical galactic disk, and I'm going to use this as my reference population, has about a uh, hundred billion stars in it, so 10 to the 11 stars in it, and the average mass of those stars is about 0.2 solar masses. Now you calculated that the average mass of a star in an IMF is about 0.3, and this value is smaller because we tend to lose the high mass stars to stellar evolution, but the low mass stars persist. So we assume a slightly smaller value for the typical mass of a star in a galaxy. Uh, looking around us, we see that there's about one star per, uh, or sorry, a tenth of a star per cubic parsec, or it's sort of in 10 cubic parsecs, you get about uh, one star. So that means the typical separation between stars is two and change parsecs out here. And then we also see that they are moving around with random velocity dispersions of about 30 kilometers per second. So this means that they're all moving around the center of the galaxy here at like, that's at, you know, this is uh, 200, let's do it in blue so we can see it. This is 200 kilometers per second, still not feeling good about seeing it, but then there's a bunch of random motions around here and the characteristic magnitude of those random motions, that's the 30 kilometers per second. And so this is, I like to think about this in the context of a highway. Uh, if everybody is sort of driving down the highway at 100 kilometers per hour, you're all kind of fixed and flowing together. What becomes an issue is whether when people are like changing lanes and stuff like that. So it's the random motions, the differences from the typical path motion that actually matter. So that's actually what's going to determine things like collisions, highway, stars, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, so this is what's actually important for what we're going to be thinking about for that. We can contrast that with some other systems. I'll use a couple other reference points. Uh, this is a globular cluster of stars. I think this is M87. Uh, no, not M87, sorry, uh, Omega Sen. I think that's what I put in here. But uh, anyways, uh, the this ha these typically have about a million stars. They're older, so there's even more stellar evolution. So we think about a 10th of a solar mass as a characteristic uh, uh, mass. And then the uh, densities are a lot higher. So instead of 0.1, this is 10,000, and their velocity dispersions are a little bit lower. So this is a dense stellar system, and we'll see that things like collisions and dynamical effects play out 
faster because of that higher density. And then we'll look at something like an open cluster, remembering that this is a bit of a misnomer, like stellar associations interacting under gravity. These have like 10,000 solar uh, masses. They're intermediate and relatively low mass density. So these will be some interesting things that we will consider uh, as our reference point. So I'll focus mostly on the disk because that's the overall stuff. And then in class, we'll contrast that with the globular clusters and the open clusters. All right then, so let's talk about stars colliding. And we uh, want to basically ask the general question, how off, how frequent are stellar collisions? And we have to sort of define what we mean by a stellar collision uh, first. So let's get let's get physical. Uh, and what we're going to talk about is we're going to essentially have a star, which I'll call M1. And it's flowing through space. And it's going to encounter another star here that I'll call M2. There's going to be a gravitational force uh, between these, and they're essentially on orbit around each other. And what I want to know is how close do those stars have to get to each other? Essentially, what is this distance here so that there's a strong gravitational interaction between them? They don't necessarily splat into each other, Plato style, and get accreted into a single star. But I want to know what happens. How do these stars get close to each other so that they actually change their direction uh, because they get really sort of tangled up in each other? Now, this particular problem is uh, well studied. And one of the neatest things in uh, gravitational astrophysics is you can reduce this to the idea that we have these two stars here. Um, and you do kind of a change of reference frame trick uh, to show that in, you know, worrying about like M1 and M2 moving with respect to each other and the fact that neither of these are fixed, you can actually move this into a model where you're like, no, 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 that's not the physics question that I want to consider. I want to consider a fixed mass because that's easy. And I want to consider what happened with mass M and I'm going to change variables from both of those stars moving to just one star moving with mass mu, and that's the reduced mass. So this is the same trick that we do in like the Bohr model of the atom uh, to basically reduce two things that are orbiting around a common center of mass to one thing that's fixed and one thing that's moving. And so when you do that, you care about the total mass m, and the reduced mass is m1, m2 over m1 plus m2. So we get this particular, you know, th this function here. When you do that, the kinetic energy of the system has a form of mv squared, except it's mu. The thing that's moving is mu v squared. And then the gravitational potential energy is gm mu over the separation that I care about, r. So basically, how far away are they? Sorry, it's that separation. Now, what we want to do is ask, well, how close do they get so that the gravitational potential energy becomes comparable to the kinetic energy? And so that is just a simple uh, sort of scaling uh, from here. We can just basically say that mu v squared over 2 is equal to gm mu over r. And we'll cancel out the mu's because uh, that's what we do. And then we solve for r. So r is equal to 2 gm over v squared. Shocking, I know. But what's kind of neat about this is I can then take this and say, all right, well, what's the actual scale for uh, this in terms of the properties in the stellar disk? So I plug in 2 and I plug in 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 meter cubed per kilogram second squared. And then I plug in my typical mass, which is 0 0.2 and I put in 1.99 times 10 to the 30th kilograms for a solar mass. And then I divide that by the velocity dispersion of uh, the disk squared. And so if I calculate that out, I get an answer of 5.9 times 10 to the 10 meters. And well, that's a big number, so I find it's useful to scale that, and the scale that's around that 
is uh, 1.49 times 10 to the 11 uh, meters per AU, and this comes out to be about 0.4 astronomical units, and because I'm sloppy, that looks like 1 AU to me. This is an interesting result which is for stars to actually get close to each other and really change their orbits because they're passing by each other, they have to get within one astronomical unit of each other. That's the size of a solar system. Um, yeah, that's pretty close. We know that a parsec is about 200,000 times larger than that. So we really got to hit this bullseye so that well, a star will pass by and actually tangle up with another star. This isn't even splatting into each other. This is just orbiting around each other and actually changing directions because they interact. So how long does it take for this to happen for a single star? It's a good question. So uh, if we want to think about that, uh, we need to sort of frame things up in th sort of thinking about the passage of a star moving by another star. And so we'll consider this star to be um, the uh, traveling one. And remember our sort of model is that one star is traveling and, one's, and the rest of the stars are fixed because of this reduced mass model. And so what we do is we ask, well, how long until the star actually closes within uh, this distance? And so we set up this idea, which is there's a cylinder with that radius, r. And I'm going to have the stars moving along, we'll say it's on a straight line here, carving out a path uh, here, so it moves along that, and it's basically catching all the stars which are within radius r of that as it goes along. It sort of sweeps that out, and over, at, uh, over a course of time t, uh, it will travel a distance vt, and so that'll be the length of the cylinder. And the criterion for actually colliding as a star is that there is one other star inside that. And these stars have a density. There's some associated target density that I'll call n star. And so the criterion for a collision is that the volume of this cylinder, which is uh, pi r squared, times the length, which is pi times 4 g squared m squared over v to the fourth times the length, which is v times tc. So this is all the volume of the cylinder, v. Let's call it vol because I already have that here. And then I have multiplied by 1, the density of stars equals one. So if there's one star in there, that's how long it will have to travel. And the longer it travels, the more stars it will pick up. But this is the criterion for one collision. And then I just solve for TC. So TC, we get a little canceling here, cubed, is equal to V cubed over 4 pi G squared M squared, uh, 4 pi G squared M squared N star squared. And so I can plug in some numbers there. And if I do so, I get an answer that is 7.0. I think it's supposed to be 7.1. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, times 10 to the 15 years. So this is quite a long time. What I've done is I've scaled this value to the V of 30 kilometers per second. And I have replaced uh, big M, which is the total, with twice the average mass there. Uh, and I plug that in there, and then I use the stellar density here for the disk, and I get an answer of 7 times 10 to the 15 years. It's a long time. Uh, so for reference, the age of the universe, the Hubble time, is about 1.4 times 10 to the uh, 10 years. And so this is something like um, 10 to the 5, 500,000 times longer than the age of the universe. Yeah, it's been a minute.
So this tells us that collisions between individual stars are rare. And in fact, um, it tells you that in the life of our galaxy, if there's something like 100 billion stars, uh, that means that over the age of the universe, we're only going to have a few million individual stars pass by each other. That's there's a lot of stars and they're all sort of whizzing by each other. But on average, this is a very rare phenomenon. I'll contend that we probably could have guessed that this was pretty long time. Uh, for if collisions were frequent, our, we wouldn't be here. Uh, our planet would have been ripped out of its orbit by a star passing nearby the sun and pulling uh, us apart uh, and sort of shredding the solar system. So, still got a solar system, so we could guess that this is kind of a long time. That's good. We like it when our solar systems uh, last and are stable over a bit of time. Even though planetary dynamics is chaotic and yeah. Yeah. It's uh, gravity's... Yeah. Gravity's weird. Uh, I, as a point of reference, I wanted to calculate this in the context of uh, actual uh, collisions using a similar set of arguments here, but talk about collisions between, say, gas particles. And in this case, we get the exact same expression for the collision time. That's just strictly based on uh, stuff, uh, you know, it's geometry and how long something travels before it hits it. But then uh, for this collision time, argument we need to use a little bit different. First off, the RC is not the value that we would expect for a, uh, the RC is not the value that we get from like gravitational interaction, but this is about the size of an atom. So I'll take this as like a Bohr radius uh, because the atoms have to get that close to each other before they bounce off. So they have to get right down and they do have to collide. And so when the co uh, atom collides, it actually gets close enough that the electron clouds of the atoms sort of push away from each other. And you get this dipole interaction that one atom bounces off of another atom. So that happens at about the scale of the Bohr radius, which for those of you following along at home is 10 to the minus 10 meters. And then I want to ask about like the collision time here in uh, a gas, say, in this room. And so in this case, the velocity dispersion of the gas uh, is the sound speed, which I'll take as root kT over the mass of the particles. Uh, so I'll take that my temperature is uh, 300 Kelvin, mostly because the numbers are round, not because I set my thermostat that high. I'll take the mass is going to be 29 times the hydrogen mass. Uh, which is 29 times 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms, which, uh, in case you're wondering, the, our, oxy, our, our, uh, our atmosphere is an oxygen-nitrogen mix, and so that's uh, in molecular form, so that's 28 mH for the nitrogen and 32 mH for the oxygen, and there's more nitrogen than oxygen, so 29 is a good approximation for the mass of a particle here. And if I plug all of these things in, uh, we get that the collision time is about 5 nanoseconds. Okay, things are bouncing off each other an awful lot. And what's interesting is we do a similar argument, use uh, space. Uh, you get a longer time because the density is a lot lower. Um, oh, I should mention the de density here uh, is just P over uh, KT from the perfect gas law, and that turns out to be about 2 times 10 to the 25th particles per meter cube. So plug all that in, you get your 5 nanoseconds. But if we go to space where the densities are sort of 10 to the 6 particles per cubic meter, n is equal 10 to the 6 per meter cubed, uh, the temperature is more like 100 Kelvin. Uh, plug all of those things in. Oh, and then the mass is around the hydrogen mass. This turns out that the collision time is still about 10 to the 3 years. Long, so a particle in space will go a thousand years before it bounces off another particle in space, but much shorter than the age of the galaxy. And so this, what we say is we often say in the context of galaxy evolution is that gas is collisional.
it's easy for the particles to bounce off of each other. And so if I throw one gas cloud at another gas cloud, a bunch of particles will hit each other. And so those gas clouds will sort of interact and bounce off of each other. Stars are not collisional. Uh, then I think the actual way we say this, uh, because me uh, speaking English, uh, is that we say stars are collisionless. This raises a great question of what happens to the individual stars if I throw a galaxy at another galaxy? The answer is they just kind of pass through each other. Uh, so they don't actually collide or interact with each other that much on a star by star basis. That's important. Okay. But if I throw a galaxy at another galaxy, uh, something happens. Those galaxies do interact here. And the key insight in terms of physics here is that uh, the individual particle interactions are unimportant, but all these particles end up pulling on uh, a, uh, each other. And so what actually matters here is the interaction of one star with the global gravitational field of the galaxy. So we approximate this because the stars are all kind of far away and we don't actually see the effects of individual stars that smoothly. We can approximate a galaxy as a smooth distribution of matter. And so we'll do this again, coming back to this idea of there being a mass density. And we'll uh, cheap out for some of the math here, and we will focus on spherically symmetric galaxies. Spherically symmetric galaxies for potentials isn't accurate. I just spent a long time talking about the symmetry of disks being cylindrical bowler, but that's a lot more math without a lot more physical insight. So I'm not going to really do too much on that here. You, if you like Bessel functions, I mean, I tell you it's it, I, no, I, I do but um yeah there, there's a bunch of weird special functions and elliptic integrals and everything which is great awesome math but not important for the physics so we're going to focus on the spherically symmetric here and try to understand the gravitational potential of mass densities and material now these are words and variables that can look very suspicious if you've taken an advanced electricity and magnetism course. So we're going to fall back and sort of work in the formalism that we did when we were discussing with uh, binding energy. And so in that case, we talked about what happens with a gravitational um, uh, force for a potential uh, for a gravitational potential. And we wanted to remind you of Newton's theorem, uh, which is really important for these spherically symmetric distributions, which is if I consider this mass distribution here with some total radius big R and some internal radius that we're considering little r, uh, the force on a test particle at a radius up here of r, that is just given by gm over r squared oriented in radially. Oops, I wrote down the force. I have to actually add a test mass to it if I do that right there, which is um, technically where I wrote down is the force per unit mass, which is a field, and we like fields. We'll do those in a few slides, but uh, I need gm m over r squared. And then the stuff in the green out here, that doesn't actually pull on the particle at all. That external mass exerts no net force uh, on this test particle there. And so m is just the mass contained within a radius. It's almost like we set up this math a couple weeks ago. Okay, so for those spherically symmetric mass distributions, they exert a gravitational potential. And so for a point mass of mass m, we know what this looks like. This is phi sub r uh, is going to be an expression for potential is gm over r and this is like an electric potential or a voltage this is the amount of energy per unit mass that's in the field so this is much more like potential and then we define a gravitational field which we'll call little g which is the derivative of that potential radially 
uh, with a negative sign. So this is negative gradient of the potential, uh, if you've seen the EMM. And so that's minus GM over R squared R hen, which was the expression that I wrote down here and stupidly called the force. So uh, yeah, so this shows us this relationship between the potential and the forces that they uh, feel. And what's neat about this following along from electricity and magnetism is that that potential is set self-consistently by the mass densities of the material here. And so I've shown it here and I assumed the mass density uh, for this as a point mass of mass big M, but instead what we have is uh, a bunch of different potentials, including our old friend, the plumber sphere. It's back and it's important. Uh, so this gives us an expression for a infinitely extended mass density profile uh, here. Uh, and we can calculate the densities and potentials and other things for such a mass density profile. Uh, for a point mass, that is what we call a delta function, just means a point at the origin. Uh, and the we also deal with something called the singular isothermal sphere, which we've referenced earlier. And you've also seen the Navarro, Frank, and White profile. So these are some common profiles that we deal with. They all have different functional forms and are kind of important. They're all spherically symmetric for our purposes. Uh, and so we can consider the potentials that come from these different mass distributions and the forces that they exert on the system. In particular, the force, uh, the force on a particle in the radial direction can be used to balance or to provide a centripetal acceleration. And so we can actually ask, well, how fast are objects orbiting another, uh, a sort of mass density profile at a given radius? And for simplicity, we'll consider the circular orbit. So this is embedded in a spherical potential. What's the mass that's, uh, what's the orbit around that in a circular plane? And so that is it basically you just set uh, MV, uh, sorry, V squared over R equal to GMM over R squared and out comes uh, the relationship between the central, uh, the, the circular velocity and the acceleration towards the center, GM over R. And for a point mass, uh, oh, so I should note that this is general, 100% general. This integrates up for everything. Uh, so that gives us uh, that value there. And for the solar system, M is roughly a point mass at the center. The sun is just a point there at the center of the galaxy or at the center of the solar system. And so uh, we get GM over R square root as our velocity profile. So that looks, you know, something like if that's R and that's V, we see a one over uh, root R profile, one over root R is the velocity profile. And that's the pattern that the planets follow. You know, Earth is up here and it's moving faster through space than, oops, uh, Neptune down here. Uh, so we often call this Keplerian. Uh, and you'll hear us say, oh, this behaves like a Keplerian disk or this is the Keplerian profile. The reason why I bring this up is when you're far away from a mass distribution or in, your, in the outskirts or all the masses inside of it, everything looks like a point mass at the center. And thus, the fastest you can drop off in terms of the velocity of the circular profile is this one over root r profile. You'll never see like one over r or one over r squared profile for this circular velocity because everything looks like a point mass. There is no negative mass to kind of, you know, damp out the effects of gravitational force. You always get this as kind of the limiting case for the velocity and things will be rotating on this profile or something less uh, steep. <clears throat> I'll just put in a note here. Uh, in Astro 320, we talk about this thing that's called the Virial Theorem. And the Virial Theorem works for steady state systems uh, and gives us a relationship between their potential and their kinetic energy. The top expression is the full form of the Virial Theorem. Uh, this is one half times the time derivative, uh, second time derivative of the moment of inertia tensor. Uh, or moment of inertia, uh, twice the kinetic energy, 
the um, gravitational binding energy. And then this is the external force on all of the particles in the system. And so the derivation of this is covered in 320. I'm not going to cover it here. It's not deeply illuminating and awesome. Doesn't set us up for some great problems later, like a lot of my other favorite derivations. And then we assume that the system is in steady state, so that time derivative is zero. And we assume it's isolated, so there's no external forces. And if you do so, you get a nice relationship between the kinetic and the gravitational binding energy. And this will hold for all the systems, not just like a single light orbits around delta function mass profiles or anything. It gives us just these uh, systems. So uh, that's, yeah, that's your uh, kind of two uh, assumptions that go into this uh, that give us this nice relation. So we'll leverage this thing a lot, the gory stuff at the top, a little less so. I should note that the angle brackets here, those little, uh, those, those indicate over time. And so this is the average kinetic energy of the system over time, refle reflecting that particles actually interact with each other and they exchange kinetic and gravitational energy uh, in those interactions within, say, a stellar cluster. But over time, the whole system's uh, kinetic and gravitational energy remain uh, described by the variable theory. So the last thing that we want to talk about is the physics of what's called relaxation. And uh, so far in the dynamics, we've talked about the importance of strong collisions, which are how two stars interact with each other as one passes by and has its uh, trajectory changed significantly by getting close to one star. So that's a strong collision. Then we talked a bit about potentials and how a the structure of a galaxy is really dictated by how one star interacts with the global smooth mass distribution. But there's another important effect, and that's this process of relaxation, which is how one star interacts weakly with a bunch of its neighboring stars. And this is important because relaxation is what gives us the random motions inside stellar disks. Because if there were no interactions whatsoever, everything would move around in a perfectly flat disk all the time. But we've been focusing on the velocity dispersions of these individual stars, and so that's why we're coming back to uh, this idea of relaxation, because that's where those random motions come from. And so this is given by a star as it's sort of moving through a field. We'll sort of imagine the star moving through. And we think about a field of other uh, stars out here. And uh, as it passes by this first one, it'll get pulled slightly down towards this first star. And then this one up here will sort of pull it back. And so then this one will pull it back a little further. And so these tiny little perturbations or bumps from the individual star give rise to this process of relaxation. And we want to figure out how important this process is and how long it takes for a system to relax. So what we're going to do is we're going to consider a star here sort of sailing by this other star. And we're going to assume that this distance uh, that it makes at closest approach, which is right here, uh, I'm sorry, you can't see that, which is right here, uh, that is going to be a distance b. And we're going to assume that that b is the size of the strong collision or larger. And as it passes by, the angle is going to be slightly deflected down here. So it's going to be deflected by a small angle phi. And the contention is that angle is small. Let's come back and try to prove that a little later. Okay. Uh, so as it's sailing by, it's experiencing a gravitational force. So that's uh, the distance from the star here to here. I'm going to consider the time t equals zero at time of closest approach. And so the length of that side is just going to be v times t, where v is uh, that magnitude, and uh, the magnitude of velocity. And so the, dist the force that this uh, particle feels is going to have a magnitude, f grav, that is equal to g m1 m2 over r squared, and r squared is b squared plus v squared t squared, uh, which is, this is a Pythagorean 
triangle. Now the whole uh, system is set up uh, so that this is a relatively weak interaction and so V doesn't change much over this. And then I want to consider the effects of the components of this force. There's a parallel component here, F parallel, and as we're moving towards the, star, the red star, the blue star is going to be sped up as it goes by, and then as it sails by, that parallel component is going to slow it back down. And so the effects of the parallel component are going to actually be symmetric, so we're going to get kind of an acceleration and then deceleration, and it's all going to balance out. It's going to be weak because this interaction is relatively weak. The perpendicular component of this uh, force is important. So that's going to be what pulls the system down a little bit. And so that gives me my angle theta, uh, phi here. And so the per perpendicular component is going to be the magnitude of the gravitational force times this uh, the cosine of this angle theta. So we want this as f perp here is f cos theta, where theta is that angle. We don't know what theta is, and it changes over the course of time, but I can write it down based on the geometry of this triangle. And I know that the cosine of that angle is going to be the adjacent side to it over the opposite side to it, so that's b over the square root of b squared uh, plus vt squared. And so this component of the term right here, that's cos theta, and then that is f. So this is just f cos theta, and we write it as um, g m1 m2 b, b squared plus b squared, vt squared, all raised to the 3 halves power. So that's just the setup of the problem, but the physics is now done. Okay, so we've now calculated the force. Uh, we can then turn this around and calculate the um, impulse from that force. So we're gonna use an impulse approximation to figure out the change in perpendicular direction momentum. And then we're gonna come back and find that angle phi as the perpendicular change in momentum over the original momentum. And that's gonna be the angle that the object has, or the star has been deflected. So let's uh, get started on that because I've got my force. Uh, my impulse is just the time integral of that from the duration of the, in, uh, of the integral, uh, for the in duration of the interaction, which is minus infinity to infinity. And then I will carry out uh, this particular integral. So let, let's get integrating. Um, the, g m m1 m2 b all that's constant i can everything in here is a constant except for the t so i'm going to pull a big old mess of it out so that gives me g m1 m2 b um and i'm going to pull all that out and then i'm going to pull a b squared out of the denominator so that'll become a b cubed and that's going to be integral minus infinity to infinity of one actually let's call it dt over the square root of one plus vt over b squared Oop, and let's uh, take advantage of my undo function so that's dt uh, and then that's one plus vt over b quantity squared raised to the three halves power cool so from here, I can do a u substitution. I'm going to want my u to be equal to vt on b, and my du is going to be dt times v over b. So given uh, those pieces, what I'll do is I will multiply the top and the bottom uh, by v over b, and then multiply the outside by b over v. So we get g m1 m2 uh, I'm going to cancel this to squared, and then I'm going to say that that becomes over b squared times a b over v is integral minus infinity to infinity of v dt over b. I have successfully u substituted 1 plus vt over b squared, all raised to the 3 halves power. Not that you can read literally any of that. Uh, another cancellation. Ooh, this is getting real good. Spicy. Okay, over BV. And now it's the integral minus infinity 
to infinity of du over 1 plus u squared all raised to the 3 halves. And um, thanks to me uh, looking it up beforehand, it's my favorite type of calculus, uh, I know that that is equal to u over the square root of u squared plus 1 evaluated from minus infinity to infinity. Uh, in the limit that u gets really large, this limits to 1. In the limit that it gets really negative infinity, it limits to minus 1. So this whole thing uh, drops out to be 2. And there I have it. It's uh, that my perpendicular change in momentum is 2g m1 m2 over bv. <gasps> Hot stuff. So then what I'll do is I will say, okay, I'm going to come back up here and say that, well, now I figured that out. That's 2g m1 m2, that's a 2, over bv times whatever is sailing by's momentum, which is m1v. Cancel, cancel. That gets me a v squared there. So then we get this is 2g m2 over b v squared. And if I plug all my numbers in, I get that uh, that's about 10 to the minus 6 radians for the solar neighborhood conditions, uh, which is tiny, real tiny. So we're not too worried about uh, these. They're, it's a small angle, not a lot of changes. All of our approximations are uh, pretty good for a typical separation between stars. Of course, if they get close, this angle becomes a lot larger. Impulse approximation gets a little shaky. Uh, but let's let's actually think about that because sometimes stars pass by really far away, and so this uh, b is going to be even bigger than usual. The angle will be smaller. Uh, but as b gets smaller and smaller and closer and closer to zero, that angle is going to get huge. It could diverges, um, and we have to kind of account for that. But you're actually more likely to pass by stars at large radius because there's kind of more area out there than they are at small radius. So let's um, let's formalize that kind of argument um, and actually think about how long it takes to build up any relaxation uh, to relax. So the um, model that we're using here is we're going to think about uh, this variable b, uh, which is the distance and the axis, we call it the impact parameter sometimes. So we're going to think about a star sailing by, and we're going to consider all of the stars in a thin cylindrical shell with a radius of b and a thickness of db. And so we have our star sailing through here, and we want to know of this, it's kind of like a Swiss cake roll or something. Oh, oof, so hungry. Yeah, so something like that, where we consider this thin shell, and we want to know how many stars are in that shell, because they're going to experience a change in um, the momentum uh, or the velocity in the perpendicular direction. They're going to experience that change is a... Um, uh, that is the, whatever this function is, which is the uh, value uh, that we saw, which was going to be the 2g uh, b v squared. And so uh, that's the angle uh, that it will be changing by. Uh, so this angle that we're changing by is uh, phi and is the 2g m2 over bv squared. And so the change in the perpendicular velocity is just this multiplied by v. So that's phi v, uh, which is going to be 2g m2 over bv. So that is basically how much the velocity of a star gets changed by interacting with stars in a cylinder here of uh, radius b and thickness db. And so that's how much it'll get perturbed. Now, we're going to do something a little funky, which is we're going to acknowledge that these deviations are kind of random. Sometimes you'll get pulled up. Sometimes you'll get pulled down. You'll get tweaked off in all of these different directions. And therefore, on average, there's no change. But 
the standard deviation of that will increase. We saw this argument with the velocity dispersion uh, before. Same thing going on here. So we don't want to necessarily calculate what the magnitude of the change is, but we want to calculate the magnitude of the change squared. And so we're going to ask, well, how much is delta V squared for an interaction with stars uh, in this thin cylindrical shell. And so this is the argument that we see sort of laid out in this integral that says the average uh, value of the perpendicular velocity squared is the average of an individual perpendicular velocity squared. And then we're going to add up and basically weight that by the number of stars that are at that distance. And if the, rate, the cylinder is really tiny, you'll get strong interactions, but it's also a tiny cylinder. And then as you get larger, there's a lot more stars out there at large distances, but their uh, interactions are correspondingly weaker. So uh, this integral is taking into account that effect. So we basically say that the uh, length of that cylinder is Vt and the uh, volume of the cylinder then is 2 pi b db, that's the end cap area, times the Vt and then the number of stars and star in that volume is n little, the, the number of density stars times 2 pi b db uh, Vt. And so that gives you uh, all the pieces that go into uh, that. And so then everything here, uh, all this stuff is just the number of stars. And then this stuff is the contribution from each of those stars. So what we're going to do is we can uh, clear all of this and actually do a little bit of plugging in here some hand waving uh, to get this all correct. Uh, so we want to carry out an integral from some minimum to some maximum, and this is gonna be important, so we'll come back to this. So this is delta V perp squared uh, is equal to that integral times the two pi B dB N star V T times two G M two over B V quantity squared. Uh, that's everything. Well, let's call it a day. So uh, we're going to pull out everything but the B's. And so this gives us four G squared M two squared over, there's a V squared here and there's a V there. So that's just over a V uh, as we pull it out. Um, there's a 2 pi in front, so this is a 2 pi times that. Uh, we've got an n star. Uh, the v's are already canceled. Uh, we'll yank out that t, which is what we care about, and we're left with a b, 1 over b squared times a b. So that's leaving me with a db over b. <gasps> Math I can do. b min to b max. Uh, this integral goes to log that's log uh, of b max over b min. We're going to give it a special name. We're going to call that the natural log of big lambda, which is sometimes called the collision parameter here. Okay, so this tells us that the time, uh, so this case it basically tells us what the perpendicular uh, velocity uh uh, spread is over after a period of time. And we're going to say that the system becomes relaxed or randomized in its motion uh, when uh, T relax is when V perp squared is comparable to the original velocity squared. And so I'm going to use this equality to figure out what the relaxation time is. So I get that 8 pi g squared m2 squared over v n star t relax relax times the log lambda is equal to v squared and from there i will turn this into da, 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 the relaxation time so that is uh this expression here so you can see all the v's 
uh, you get your v cubed, your 8 pi g, everything sort of sorts out. And then we have this term, 1 over log b max over b min. Now, the reason why I can be a little fast and loose with what um, b min and b max are and all that stuff is it's in a logarithm. And logarithms are very soft functions. They, it takes a lot to make them change. Uh, and everything else here depends linearly or better on those variables. So typically, the assumption I make is that I set b min as the inner radius where my approximation breaks down, which we'll set as the strong collision radius. So we set b min is equal to the 2g uh, uh, m over v squared. And then we typically set b max to be the size of the system. So if it's the thickness of a disk, we pick like 300 parsecs uh, of disk. So maybe about 300 parsecs. Or, heck, pick the whole galaxy, or 10 kiloparsecs, whatever. Because if I pick the former, I get log lambda is about 18. And if I pick the latter, I get the log lambda is about 22. Not much. So not a real big change between uh, these uh, values here. It's, you know, 20%. And... When's the last time you saw me care about a 20% answer in kind of a theoretical argument? Can't get it quite right because of the details, so it's pretty good. Uh, and then we can compare this expression to our collision time, and we see that uh, the ratio of those is the collision time over 2 log lambda, and that gives us uh, our interaction. For a galactic disk, this is still a really long time. It's like, you know, 10,000 or 1,000 times the Hubble life. Yeah, uh, sorry, 10,000 times the Hubble lifetime. But um, it's still not, uh, it still shows us that this is more important than the actual collisions here. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's the gist of it. Uh, but you don't think that our galaxy should be relaxed. Uh, we have ordered motion in it. Right, those uh, those stars are ordered, and so we uh, have this orbital motion. It's not a spherical system, but as we see as we go through some other cases in class, some systems are relaxed, and so we'll talk about this as the time which uh, the motions of a system end up randomized. Okay. That's all I want to talk about today. It was a lot. There was a lot of physics and a lot of dynamics in here, but this should get us equipped to really understanding the shapes of stellar systems. So that's all, and I'll see you next week.